Today, I'm going to be talking about platform teams. Uh, more specifically, platform teams that build internal tools and services, and even more specifically, platform teams, um, product management in platform teams that build internal tools and services. And now you might be thinking, in what track am I? This doesn't sound like APIs or internal, internal developer portals. And it's not. Um, but it just as might could have been. Um, the examples that I'm using is coming from my team, which is a platform team, but I've spent a large part of my career working with APIs and internal portals, and these lessons apply just as much to it um, than platform teams. So, on to the presentation. Um, why am I talking about this? So, a few months ago, I saw something on the ThoughtWorks tech radar that really interested me. Now, the ThoughtWorks tech radar is basically a collection of things that the ThoughtWorks team find interesting in tech at that point in time. And what was on there was the following. Applying product management to internal platforms. But what does that mean? So, their definition, and I'm going to read this for you, is as follows. Applying product management to internal platforms means establishing empathy with internal consumers, read developers, and collaborating with them on the design. Platform product managers establish roadmaps and ensure the platform delivers value to the business and enhances the developer experience. Some owners even create a brand identity for the internal platform and use that to market the benefits to their colleagues. Ah, so I read this and I thought, this is interesting. I am a product manager and I work in an internal platform team. Maybe this thing that I'm doing is not as common. So, who am I? Um, I am a product owner. I work at HelloFresh. Um, HelloFresh is a company that does meal delivery kits. So, we send you boxes with food and you make it. Um, I've worked in a few industries, but I think the thing that I've loved the most is, like I said, working on APIs and the documentation around that. And I know a lot of people here from the documentation community, so I'm super excited to be actually talking in this track. So, what does a platform team at HelloFresh mean? Our setup kind of looks something like this. Um, we've got a bunch of consumer-facing tribes, and their customers are the people that get the boxes. So, we've got a conversions team that makes sure people can are buying their first boxes. We've got a retention team that makes sure that people keep on buying the boxes. We've got supply chain, which gets the boxes from a warehouse to your door. And we've got a data team, so that we can forecast better who will need boxes when. And then we have the platform team, which is where I work. And our customers are all of these tribes. Um, our customers are developers, and our main job is to make them more effective with the things that they are doing. So, back to this tech radar thing. Um, as I was looking at it, I was wondering why is this now a thing? Um, platform teams have existed for a while, product management has existed for a while, so what's the deal? And I think it's becoming something more popular now because more companies are realizing that if they build up teams that focus specifically on their internal developers, uh, they can build a team that really supercharges the productivity of the rest of their organization. So, and I mean, if this goes well, it's really, it's a multiplier for productivity. But if it doesn't go well, then it kind of becomes a fix-it team. Um, so when things go well, nobody has any idea what's happening with this team. And when things don't go well, then they have to go into firefighting mode, which is not fun. And also, unfortunately, this is where my team was at the beginning of the year. We were a bunch of developers, and they were building things for the rest of the organization, but they didn't really feel appreciated. Uh, the rest of the organization said they felt like the platform team was a black box. They had no idea what was coming out. And the developers felt underappreciated. They felt like they were putting in a lot of effort and no one was recognizing the things that they're doing. And in this case, um, I think it's even more important to have product management in your internal teams because they're so much closer to their customers. When things go bad, your customers know exactly where you sit and they can come right up to you and tell you that they don't like it. Whereas if things are going well, 
then your team has this amazing front row seat to see how your organization changes. So luckily, my team is not there anymore. Um, this past year, we've implemented a lot of things in our team, um, people and product management things, and the team has really turned around. And I'm here to share with you some of the practical tips that we implemented, and to answer the question, how do you apply product management principles to a platform team? Right, so to answer this question, we first need to know what is product management. Now there's a lot of definitions, and I'm glad I'm not in the product management track because someone would have had other opinions on this, but for me, I think the most simple definition for product management is a combination of these four things. It's stakeholders, processes, communication, and a vision. Now, I sound really boring when I rattle off definitions, so instead of doing that, um, I'm going to talk about what does it look like if these things are not in your team. Um, what are the dysfunctions of product management that you might spot if these things are missing? So, for that example, I'm going to start with an engineering team. Our engineering team, they're there, they're working, they are producing things, and they have no idea where it's going. For me, they don't know who their stakeholders are, and this is kind of like a bottomless pit. They're putting things out there, and it's just going away. There's no feedback, and they have no idea where it's going. So how do you solve this? You solve this by finding out who your stakeholders are. What we did is we listed all our projects and we wrote down who are the people that are actually using them. And, I mean, spoiler alert, it was developers most of the time. But the interesting thing was we found a few projects that didn't have developers as their primary stakeholders. And after we did this exercise, it was a lot easier to justify why this marketing service that we're maintaining, that it should be moved over to a different team so that they can give it the proper love and attention for their specific stakeholders. So, back to our example. Our engineering team has now figured out who their stakeholders are. They're building things specifically for them, but it's not going that well yet. Uh, the stakeholders have no idea when things are coming from the team, and the engineering team isn't really talking to their stakeholders and getting proper feedback. This happens because of poor communication. And this is kind of like tangled earphones. So if you have some tangled earphones in their bag, it's always a pain. You don't know how to untangle it. You don't know where it goes what. And this is for me kind of like when you have bad communication. The biggest thing that I learned with our communication is that good communication should not be an information dump. And I think developers um, building things for developers are especially prone to this problem. Uh, they think if they provide more information, it will be better. But it's not the case. You kind of have to curate your information still for the people reading it because they don't have the same context. How do you do this? You do this by telling a story. And for the kinds of documentation and communication that we do most often, um, I've got some tricks to help our team write better communication. The first is uh, we lo write lots of readmes. And if you think about the people who are reading your readmes, it's probably someone that's not familiar with your project. They want to know what it can do for them, and they ideally want to know what's the quickest way I can go from not having this to having this. And the trick that I have for writing this is think about a recipe. So if you get a recipe somewhere, it first starts off, not with um, the steps, it starts by telling you what you're going to make. So you are going to cook a delicious chocolate cake now. What it does after that is it gives you a list of ingredients that you have to follow, which is kind of like requirements, and then it gives you clear step-by-step -step instructions of how to get from ingredients to a nice chocolate cake. And that works surprisingly well for readmes as well. The next tip um, for things that we write often is release notes. And for release notes, um, that's typically someone that's already familiar with your project. And what they want to know is, is this worth my time to install this? Do I want this new thing? Do I even care? And for that, I like to think of a brochure. 
So if you get a flyer in the mail, it doesn't spend three pages telling you about a service. It comes right out in big text and tells you, you should come and do bungee jumping. It's amazing. You will lose your fear of heights and all your friends will love you. And that's what you want to be channeling as well in your release notes. You should really emphasize what the benefits are that your users will get from this new release and stick the longer form doc documentation and the implementation details to the actual commits. They can go and look there as well. The last thing that's my personal bugbear as well is error messages. And for an error message, the person reading this is already not in a good state of mind. They're trying to do something and they haven't succeeded. Um, what they want at that point is something to just get them out of that situation as fast as possible. And for that, I think we should we try and channel good Stack Overflow answers. So what happens if you have a problem? You take the error, you paste it in Google, you find the first Stack Overflow answer and you copy and paste what they tell you to do. So if you're writing error messages, cut out this middle man of Googling things Tell your user how they can fix their problem so they can get on with actually working with your product. Yeah, I think overall with documentation, the last tip in communication is that you should write and communicate honestly. I think a lot of times people think that uh, if there's some use case that your product doesn't cover or if something that doesn't work well, you shouldn't write it somewhere because then will, people will think you're weak or you're not doing a good job but it's actually the opposite. Um, if someone has to spend two hours trying to do something and they only realize then that it's an undocumented bug, they don't like you. <laughs> um, and actually, if you can tell that to them upfront, you're building trust with your users. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, they'll love you more if they don't have to spend those two hours hunting around for the problem. Okay, communication is my favorite part, so that was also the longest. Um, Back to our example, uh, our engineering team has figured out who their stakeholders are and now they're communicating well with them. They're writing release notes, um, they're, they're actually figuring out what the stakeholders want, but now something else is happening. What's happening is we get stakeholders going to developers going like, hey, hey, I need you to do something for me, quickly. And Team members are somehow working at the same thing and they don't know that their colleague is doing it. What's now happening is that there are no processes. And this is kind of like dodgeball. So the person that shouts the loudest or throws the ball the hardest gets their thing worked on. And someone told me like, why are you using this image? This looks like fun. I don't know about you, but I don't like having balls thrown at me. <laughs> this is definitely not my idea of fun. So. The processes, what do you do if you realize your team doesn't have good processes? First thing is just don't panic. What you want to do is you want to implement predictable and transparent team processes. Now, there are books written about what team processes work best. Um, for my team, we decided on a Kanban workflow. That was the easiest thing for us. And we, our weeks look pretty much the same every week. We've got plannings on Fridays, we've got backlog reviews on Thursdays, and the predictability part I think is important. Um, you free up your developers' time to, that don't have to worry what's happening now and this week. They can stop thinking about the processes and just focus on the work they have to do. And the transparency part really helps with other people. Um, if your processes are transparent, like I'm even surprised by how well this works, that like, people come to me and say, like, oh, I need this thing done. They go like, well, we plan on Fridays, so the first time that I have to look at this is that date and date, that date, and they're okay with that. This is a weirdly magical way of actually getting people off of your back. But okay, so processes, our team now, they're building things for their stakeholders, they're communicating well, and they have a process for how to tackle their work. But what's happening now? Their backlog is growing. There's more and more things, and they don't know how to sort out the important things from the not important things. What they're dealing now is something like a litter box, but without the shovel. And this is because they don't have a vision. Your vision is like a scoop for your litter box. 
Um, it helps you to prioritize what's important and take out the things that aren't important in your system, which is something like this. So you can remove stuff from your system, and that's what your vision does for you. And honestly, this vision part was the most difficult thing we had to do in the past year. Um, and for me, I found the most important learning from this is that we had to start somewhere. When we try to do a mission um, or write a vision at the beginning of the year, we couldn't figure something out and we just left it. Then somewhere in the middle of the year, we revisited again and we decided on something. We decided, screw this, it won't be perfect, we're going to divide our team up into functional areas. Uh, the functional areas that we decided was, and this is not that important, but cloud runtime for looking at our AWS environment, traffic for looking at our edge layer and CDN, we've got observability that looks at metrics and tracing, we've got engineering releases that takes developer code from their computers to production, and we've got engineering experience that looks at how to increase the productivity of the developers in the company. And the thing is, before we define these things, what we couldn't do is we couldn't experiment. And what was nice is after we defined these things, we could suddenly, we could iterate. Um, we could figure out what was working and what wasn't working. And that just really made such a big difference. And I'm actually uh, super unhappy that we didn't do this earlier because I think we could have gotten a lot more learnings had we just started somewhere at the beginning of the year. And that is the definition for me of product management. You've got an engineering team building things specifically for their stakeholders, they're communicating well, and they're using their vision to prioritize the things that are important and remove the things that aren't important. Now, if this is product management, and we've applied this to my team, and I've given you the examples now, how has my team changed? Uh, what's happened in the past year with my colleagues and everything? So I think our team, it's been a huge improvement. Uh, we've gone from the beginning of the year where my team was feeling isolated to now where we're really part of the rest of the HelloFresh developer environment. Uh, we've got communities that have come up around the tools that we build and we've even, our users are so engaged that they're actually making pull requests to our tools to add additional features and functionality. In a happiness survey, um, from the beginning of the year to now, we've gone from one of the unhappiest teams in the organization to one of the happiest. And I feel like the takeaway here is uh, we've done all these things, but it's not that difficult. Um, it's a bunch of small things, and I don't think you need a dedicated product manager to do this. You can do this. Uh, you can go back to work after this conference, and you can write a nicer release note. You can figure out who's, work, who's using this thing that you're working on, and you can go and talk to them. And that is what I want to leave you with today as well. Go out and try these things. Um, you have nothing to lose by doing this, and you only have your team's happiness to gain. So, thank you very much.